Ah, now you stopped. Now we can say long live Stalin or what. And we, are, we are not recorded there. Or <laughs> Slavoj Žižek is a big, friendly Slovenian Marxist intellectual who spends as much time blathering on about Batman films as he does about Hegel. He's written about 75 books, most of which remain impenetrable to me, but it's his public appearances, both at lectures and at events like Occupy Wall Street, which have really cemented his position as the most broadly popular anti-capitalist philosopher working today. This is because, unlike pretty much every other anti-capitalist philosopher, he actually has a sense of humor. His latest project is a film, The Pervert's Guide to Ideology, directed by Sophie Fiennes. In it, Slav uses Hollywood blockbusters to explain why the bulk of us remain so enthralled to capitalist power structures that we cannot even escape them in our sleep. I wanted to know why I was such a sheeple, so I went to Slovenia to meet the man. Hello. I hate life. Hi. You hate life? I'm running from seven around. It's Alex. It's hell of a day. Well, hi, hi. Uh, it's me. Uh, uh, okay, whatever. <laughs> so we go my place then. No? Amazing, fantastic. Yeah. When you're in town here, do yeah. you ever get approached by local fans or something like that? What do you mean by fans? Like... People hate me pretty much here. I'm not kidding. I wasn't for independent Slovenia. I didn't care about that. I also didn't have any Yugoslav nostalgia. Many leftists have it and they consider me a traitor there. My nostalgia is for the old times 40 years ago when I was young. You know, even phones were not used so much. This was nice because once a day, in the morning, post arrived, and that was it. That was all communication. Yeah, then you know you are free for 24 hours. I noticed you've got Joe Stalin on your This wall. is just so that it, not, I don't mean you personally, idiots when they enter the flat ask me why do you have them. It's strictly for <laughs> this. It's just to annoy people. It's absolutely just to annoy people. <laughs> I've read on the front of your books it's quoted that you're the most dangerous philosopher in the West. You don't seem very dangerous to me. Here I must disappoint you, you know. I am this type of a joker guy. I mean joker from Batman, you know. Yeah, I know. I laugh and so on, but I can be a Stalinist when I... If you give me power, I know how to use it. That's why I'm afraid almost of myself. I don't want power. I'm extremely sensitive. It's beautiful that you were on time there. Yeah. You know, even in love relations, you know what's my motto? I quote Lacan when he says, my fiancé is never late for an appointment because the moment she is late, she's no longer my fiancé. <laughs> That's the attitude. You know what's one of my tricks? I like it. When I give a talk, or especially if it's a debate, it's good to begin on time or even a little bit earlier because then people who are even on time or two minutes late feel a little bit guilty, you know. Why do you want them to feel guilty? Just so because they... they don't ask stupid, annoying questions. I hate debates. I, people think that I like to give talks. No, I like to write. If you don't like giving talks, how do you feel about making films? because obviously The Pervert's Guide to Ideology is coming it's, out, it's, that's you know, you, what we're uh, talking about. You a very traumatic point. I'm disgusted just looking at myself on screen. So it's not some kind of a extravaganza to say, I really, I didn't see, I saw neither Pervert's Guides to Cinema nor this one, Pervert's Guide to Ideology. I'm too horrified at looking at myself on screen. Ordinary Americans, as ordinary people in all countries, have a multitude of fears. We fear all kinds of things. We fear, maybe, immigrants or people whom we perceive as lower than ourselves, attacking us, robbing us. In Steven Spielberg's Jaws, the function of the shark is to unite all these fears so that we can, in a way, trade all these fears for one fear alone. Why is cinema such a useful tool for you when you're trying to analyze the world? Mostly the way I talk about cinema is simply to use it to illustrate where we are today ideologically. How do we experience our lives? What do we find worth fighting for? What's the meaning of our life or small ritual? You have to look at Hollywood, where you get it in pure distilled form. Hey, buddy. You gonna pay for that or what? Look, buddy, I don't want no house today. Either pay for it or put it back. 
Well, your film starts with a clip from They Live, the John Carpenter movie, which is a great movie. If we were able to put on those glasses, yeah. what do you think would happen? If everyone in the world suddenly put on the They Live glasses, what would the next day be like? It would be the end of ideology, I mean. I, th I, I, I claim that... Uh, okay, I will give you one example. A typical boss no longer wants to be a boss, you know. Mm -hmm. Imagine this postmodern companies like some digital programming company, creative agency. A boss is, uh, comes in jeans, embraces you with all uh, vulgarities. Did you have a good fuck last <laughs> night, whatever? But fuck you, then he remains a boss. He nonetheless gives orders. But the social game is you have to pretend that we are friends and so on. In this relations, the first step to liberation is to force him to really behave like a boss. To tell him, no, fuck you, no comradeship, treat me as a boss, give me explicitly orders and so on. Well, Sorry, <laughs> seriously, uh, can I give you some fucking fruit juice or I'd coke? I'd love some fucking yeah. fruit juice, yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, just, uh, Coke. Iced tea. So uh, here it's included the cancer you get because it's zero, which means instead of sugar you get all those sweeteners. Some films that you seem to be pretty interested in, although very critical of, are the like Christopher Nolan Batman films. This is how crazy Batman's made Gotham. You want order in Gotham. Batman must take off his mask and turn himself in. Oh, and every day he doesn't, people will die starting tonight. I think he's a great director. You don't think Christopher Nolan has no, a conservative agenda? No, he's agenda. a liberal. He's a liberal who is afraid of too much uh, commotion, too much, too, too violent. But he says this. The one with uh, Heath Ledger, Joker, it's really a Bush era film because at the end you have reasserting the necessity of a lie. No, like Batman has to take guilt upon himself. Yeah blah, 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 and it's interesting how... So it's the idea of feeding a myth to... Yeah, basically the message is our societies can only survive through a benevolent lie or whatever. There's a point where you're talking about taxi driver. Yeah, and it uh, seems... uh, that was a problematic point, in, incidentally, in the sense that... State secret. I don't like Scorsese. I didn't oh, really? like the movie. No, You've I got didn't... two Scorsese films in the movie. Which is the other one? Uh, Last Temptation of Christ. Yeah, but this was because uh, but, but Sophie wanted me to do something about Christianity, blah, blah, but my heart was not in but it. I see, you say you don't like Scorsese, but I feel like you identify with Travis Bickle. He was on the right path, in a way, Travis, in The Taxi Driver. You should have the outburst of violence, and you should direct it at yourself, but in a very specific way. At what in yourself Change you, ties you to the ruling ideology. Within the film, you seem to use his uh, his suicide as a an example of what people should be doing, and people should be violently ripping themselves uh, apart from the ideology. Yeah, but you have more to... intelligent ways to do it. Like my favorite example here from Fight Club. You know when he confronts his boss mm -hmm. and then starts to beat himself? This is a much more painful, shocking scene than if he were to attack directly the boss. This is a better example, I think. If you want to do critique of ideology, if you want really to get free, first you have to beat yourself. I am Jack's smirking revenge. What are you doing? Oh. Ideology is not only the world we live in, but especially the wrong ways we imagine how to escape. There, precisely when you dream how to escape from reality, you just reproduce the same world. I was in the London riots, and you talk about the London riots, and what struck me being in them, reporting on them, was how yeah. different they were to riots I've been in Greece or I'd been in, in Germany. Yeah, every violent acting out is a sign that there is something you are not able to put into works. Even the most brutal violence is the enacting of a certain symbolic deadlock. I wanted to find out if you thought that this was 
an example of the true power of ideology when for one night the superstructure collapsed and yeah. people seemed yeah. to be allowed to do whatever they wanted, yet all they wanted to do was steal more yeah, trainers exactly. and consume more. But for this I'm hated by many leftists who desperately try to redeem the London riots. They claim, and I partially, very partially agree, they claim even if it was just uh, uh, attacking the supermarket, whatever. Nonetheless, it was a blind, large-scale protest. But where I disagree with them was that they claim you begin like this and then you make it a proper political movement. Yeah. I tell them, okay, but this second step will never happen. <laughs> you know, it's like Stalinists were saying, okay, we have some violence, purges, gulags now, but wait one generation, then we will have. Uh, uh, sorry, that second step will never arrive. If you look at practically all revolutions, they happen when things get a little bit better, a little bit of opening, then expectations explode and are disappointed and so on. Look even at Egypt. Mm. I'm sorry to tell you, this is horrible to say, but you know that under Mubarak, Egyptians probably lived relatively well on average. There was a new middle class and so on and so on. And they... Yeah, it was the middle class that rose yeah. up to overthrow Mubarak. Yeah, and there we also saw in a tragic way the limitation. Because uh, the middle class, there was no more broad popular left for them to get connected to. I think some people with Egypt uh, seem to assume that because of this kind of revolving situation of coups, all of the revolutions have been rendered pointless. I wonder if you think that it's kind of the, the seeds of something more revolutionary have been set within In the, the long society. term, yes, because, you know, I'm not a total pessimist there. It's not simply that we are back at Mubarak's time. Something did happen, to put it in pathetic terms, civil society awakened. You have a whole network of trade unions, women organized, intellectuals, society, social, secular life, neither corrupted army industrial complex, nor Muslim Brotherhood awakened. And this is something, you know, I always quote today Walter Benjamin, who said that behind every fascism there is a failed revolution. We should never forget that so-called Muslim fundamentalists are an ersatz for the failed left. The key event in Arab countries of the last decades is the disappearance of secular left. Take Afghanistan. Yeah. Afghanistan was not a conservative fundamentalist country. I remember 40 years ago, it was a progressive monarchy with a pro-Western king. Then they had a local communist party, which was so strong that it even took over. And then, you know, Russia intervened, Americans supported fundamental uh, uh, Muslim. That is to say, 40 years ago, Afghanistan was a relatively open, technocratic, secular country. It is true, it's very involvement into international politics that it became fundamentalist. And, and even uh, Islamic fundamentalism has its roots in kind of psychotub and his uh, kind of Marxist view That's, of Islam. Yeah, 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 yeah. And I think so. I think that this is the big task today. How to get out of this vicious cycle of pro-Western liberalism and fundamentalism, they are really feeding upon each other, I think. What do you think is going to happen with Syria? Because there doesn't seem to be... Oh, strong... I was so attacked for saying, uh, uh, when I wrote, they published it in a Guardian only on the net, that it's a pseudo-conflict. What I mean, do you mean by it being a Yeah, conflict? yeah, I know that all oh, pseudo-conflict, but people are dying, how can you be so cynical? No, by pseudo-conflict, I mean, of course, it's a tragedy, people are dying and so on. It's simply... Uh, uh, ethnic religious conflict, no big emancipatory stakes are involved now. I am totally against Assad. I believe in incredible brutality they are doing, but with this poisonous gases, okay, what makes me furious here is now media start to tell this story, oh my God, uh, uh, they are poisoning their own population, where well, Saddam was doing this against Iranians at Kurds, United States were giving him uh, uh, satellite photos, we all know, and providing him even gases. I don't like to be manipulated and shown by the media, you see, it's horrible what happens there. Yeah, it's horrible, but my God, every revolution is not only, if it is an authentic revolution, is not only directed towards the future, but it redeems also the past failed revolutions. All the ghosts, as if were the living dead of the past revolution, 
which are roaming around unsatisfied will finally find their home in the new freedom. I know what will you do then to me. Then I have to sign yeah, some yeah, paper, yeah. <laughs> which basically means hardcore. You can use me. You yes. can put my hat on a guy fucking three <laughs> women and I cannot complain. I cannot. <laughs> I cannot you wouldn't it. complain if we did. I don't <laughs> care. <laughs> I don't care. That's true. Yes. <sighs>